One of the things that, you know, if you've ever watched a, a, a baseball catcher run, they don't run very well because they're always in an isometric static position. They're very, very strong, but they're always basically squatting in, their, in an isometric static position. If you take that similar position and begin to do some bounce work with it, and you can do it through different angles, you'll be surprised how fast you'll get strong. And that, that strength actually transfers more to speed development, jumping development, deceleration, and just the plain old squat does. That was Jeff Hauser, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Lost Empire Herbs. I am a huge fan of the company. Taking a herbal, natural approach to supplementation has been an absolute game changer for me. And it's products that I use, that I know, and that not just I know, but also that other athletes and coaches have mentioned to me that they really love using this stuff. I take sponsors that I personally use and believe in, and Lost Empire Herbs is an epitome of that company. If you want to check out the herbs that I use, that I enjoy, and you can learn a little bit more about them and grab 15% off your order, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. If you want to dip your toe in the herbal supplementation waters, you can get pine pollen, which is one of the four ingredients in the Phoenix formula, which is one of my favorites. You can get a bag of pine pollen for free with the modest cost of shipping, and you can do that by heading to justflypinepollen.com. Today's guest is track and sport performance coach Jeff Hauser. Jeff Hauser has been coaching track and field since 1971. He himself was a six-time ACC champion, and he was named one of the ACC's top 50 track athletes of all time. In his coaching career, Jeff had numerous stops on the D1 coaching circuit, and lately he has been, for the last 20 years, a speed and sports performance coach at Duke University. In the world of speed and performance training, it can be said that you don't know what you don't know. In other words, we so oftentimes will be using what we use as athletes when we coach. We'll take what we use as athletes, what we felt worked for us, and we'll use that in coaching. Or we'll use the common collective forms of training and exercises and knowledge and a repainted variations of that in coaching. But what Jeff calls the dark side of the moon is that which we don't know yet. And today's show is all about that. If you've seen Jeff's training methods, you will see not fancy exercises, simple exercises but ones that we oftentimes don't see, ones that we oftentimes aren't so aware of. But Jeff's training movements are based off of what we see in really fast athletes, and they get results. Jeff gets substantial time drops in his team sport athletes. He's worked with elite track and field competitors, and he's also had the opportunity to work with the number one high school 40-yard dash athlete in the country, taking him from a 4-4 to a 4-2-5 that was combined electronically timed, and he'll be talking about that on the tail end of the show today. Before we get to that, Jeff will go into how sprint training and speed training has changed in the last 50 years. He'll be talking about what he does and doesn't find helpful in speed development. He'll be getting into a variety of sprint and speed training constraints and self-governing drills, which you can also check out a few of those on the show notes section of the JustFlySports.com website. He'll be chatting about oscillatory lifting, power development principles, and much more. This show blends several important elements of biomechanics, strength, and program philosophy into a package that is impactful for any coach or athlete. It was awesome talking with Jeff. Let's get on to episode 317. Jeff, it's great to have you on the show. You know, back from when I had Sheldon Dunlap a long time ago, he had mentioned your influence on him, oscillatory reps, and I'm really, I'm really excited to get your, your speed and strength training expertise and to kind of kick things off. I, I don't always ask this, but I am particularly interested in your background, how you eventually got into strength and conditioning, sports performance, your track and field background. So could you share a little bit of your story in terms of your background um, in track and then what led you into more the traditional sports performance field? I appreciate the kind words and um, very, very flattered to be on, on your podcast here. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and I went to school, high school at Marsh Park High School in Charlotte. Ran track there, obviously, and uh, ran 110 hurdles was my primary event. Went to college on a track scholarship. Went to the West Coast of Stanford briefly and came back to Duke. I'm a Duke graduate. I ran track internationally from 1968 to basically 1985. Had a, had a long career. 
met a lot of really, really good influential people and had been influenced by a lot of the greats in the field. And I'm really appreciative of that. I was coaching track, actually, at University of Florida, UCLA briefly, North Carolina, North Carolina State, and Duke. I got out of collegiate coaching, track and field, and went into retail. I had a smaller chain of retail athletic stores. I continued to coach some of the postgraduate athletes during that time, but basically was not involved in the, in the collegiate arena. In 1999, Duke University asked me to come back as a consultant for the football team. So I came back and did a, a spring, basically, for their, their off season, and they decided to create a job for me. So I became the speed agility and conditioning coach at Duke. It was primarily for football when the other, other coaches figured out or found out that I was available for them also. So I ended up getting a pretty pretty tight schedule at one point in time. Or at, I had actually 26 teams that I coached at one point in time, the entire spectrum of the, of the Duke, all the teams at Duke at that time. And it, uh, I was the speed agility and conditioning coach. We had an administrative change in 2006. And when we had the administrative change, we went to the same format that most colleges and universities have in that there's one coach, a strength coach that does all of the speed, agility, conditioning, and strength training for each team. So at that point in time, they asked me, it took a year or so for that to happen, but they said, you, you, we'd like for you to become a strength coach also, and we're going to use that format. So I got into strength conditioning in 2009 and still coaching my post my postgraduate track athletes. During my career at Duke, I rotated through every team again as a strength conditioning coach. So just about every team I, that I worked with previously. And um, had a lot of experience with a, with a lot of different kinds of sports that have different demands. There's a commonality in all of them, but there's, a, there's also, you got to train, train them all differently, as you all know. So that is my, my journey into strength and conditioning I still coach some track athletes, but my background and, and most of my activity in the last 10 years or so has been in the strength conditioning area. Yeah, you said, Jeff, that you had gotten, Duke got you back in 1999. So what, what years uh, or, or decades were you, before that, were you coaching track? Like how long back did that go for you? I started coaching track in, 2000, in 1971 okay. when I went to graduate school at University of Florida. Jimmy Carnes was a was the head track coach there. He was uh, the Olympic coach during the boycott year. And I coached there when I was in graduate school. And I left there, went to UCLA briefly, and then um, came back and got into the retail business, a group called Athletic Attic, and had a few Athletic Attic stores in the North Carolina area and continued to coach postgraduates at that point in time. Gotcha. Yeah, the reason I asked with the timeline is I, I like talking with coaches who have you know, my, my timeline starts the coaching track. I mean, I started in, um, what is it, 2000 and 2007. And so it's like, you know, it's just, I, I, you see a lot of times you see all these like, like drills or methods and you think it's new. And then like I've read Dan John's stuff and the track and field Omni <clears throat> book and you go back and like, oh, wow, it's interesting to read about the training that was going in the 60s and the 70s. And I think a lot of times, and I'm sure this was going on, you know, it's just the over distance, you know, the, the, the too much volume type thing. I think maybe that's more just stay around high school. You know, I'm not really sure, but there was really good training going on well before we thought. And a lot of these drills that we think are new were around well before we thought like the, even like mini hurdles, I think Dan Paffett said that the Japanese were using that type of stuff, like, like in the early 1900s and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm curious you know, your, your thoughts on how training has progressed since the seventies, you know, when you were like, what type of stuff was around that we think is new might have been around then. And I, I just like, take me through a little bit of time and progression and speed training and what the, the philosophies were back then. Well, obviously the science wasn't as advanced as it is right now, but, um, speed training was, there was no real acknowledgement of backside, frontside mechanics back in those days. There was no, no one really addressed that. They basically, it was more of, Power development, just basically running as much as you could. A lot of incline running back in those days. You didn't see wickets come in. From what I can remember, we used to use uh, we used to use two by fours actually. We'd take two by fours and turn them up on the edge, 
as a visual barrier, not not necessarily for anything other than yeah. the fact that you knew you had to pick your foot up, and it forms basically made you do the same thing mechanically as a wicket does. It was just a, just a little bit lower, and you were you were a little scared of it, so you had to get your feet. Um, <laughs> Something to scare you a little bit, yeah. It's got it. You could yeah. trip. You could trip is the thing. <laughs> no, it was it was you know some similar type stuff. The science just wasn't there to back mm-hmm. it up. A lot of it was just was anecdotal as far as evidence was concerned. And the coaches who were there were basically, they were artists. They had uh, a feel for it that I don't see a lot anymore. It, it, we're, we're really pretty data-driven right now. And, and we are science-driven. We made some big improvements there. But from a coaching eye standpoint, they were, they were brilliant. And I was very lucky to be around a lot of them for a long time. Yeah, it is, it is interesting to look at how pendulums swing and shift. I mean, obviously, it's an important thing that the data and the science and the, the data to validate training methods and, and show us where we are has come along. But at the same time, when your complete mindset shifts into some of that, I guess you could call it more linear thinking. I think that it can it can predispose people to not get into the creativity or not not try to be creative as much. And I do think they can exist together. I, I, that's the thing. I don't think they have to be separate, but I, I definitely... You know, I wasn't around at that time, but I can definitely see what you're saying with that. Uh, yeah, it. Um, I've actually been able to to kind of pass time through, you know, from, from one era to another regarding coaching philosophy and uh, and, and you know, just changing of, of thought. We know now, science from a science standpoint, that front side mechanics from they, they work, and then you say basically we're discovered to trying to, I guess, figuring out, you know, what do the what do the fast people do? That was not around back in my day, and I, I was actually taught. To stay on the ground, push as hard as you can, as long as you can. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Is, <laughs> and here again, I, I learned from my high school coach. High school coach actually was very good. But that was the thought back in the other day. You know, put as much power and put as much force in the ground as you can. Push yourself forward as, as, as much as you can. A big, big, big emphasis on just about nothing but horizontal force, no vertical component thought to it. it from my experience at that point in time, that evolved at a higher level as I got up. But it, it is... Science has, has given us a, a different look at you know, how the body works, obviously, mechanically, and we've adapted to it. And I had to change my philosophy. I, I used to coach the way that I was coached, and I see a lot of that in coaches now. Hmm. And um, that adjustment is difficult to make, but when the evidence is there, you have a choice. You can, you can do it correctly or you can not do it at all. So. Yeah. It's really interesting you mentioned that, the idea of coaches actually saying to push as long as you can or as hard as you can. And I, I, a lot of times I think about, okay, well, right now the common thing is we'll run tall and really get front side to the point where it actually diminishes. I know we'll talk about this, where it actually diminishes an, an athlete's ability to have good leverage on the ground, to create the lever systems, to have to operate on the ground. And it's almost like, you know, pendulums always swing. It's almost like it was so bad. I, and I think about this sometimes because... Yeah, like you don't want to you you don't want to actively be trying to push, especially it's like you have the opportunity for an impulse when you're sprinting, and once that opportunity has passed, anything volitional that you're trying to do is going to work against yourself. But at the same time, I just think it's interesting that the pendulum swung away from that, thankfully, but it almost swung so far. It just everything is so tall front side. We've we've swung completely the other direction, and I and it's going to swing you know back and balance. You know, everything kind of swings back in the balance over time. So I, I was unaware that it was so that coaches were actually saying that back in the seventies. I, I find that kind of funny. No, it, it was um, that was my introduction to basically you know, how do you run fast? You know, push your ground as hard as you can, as long as you can. As I moved through my career, obviously I was I was coached somewhat differently as as I was coming up and then my, my talents were evolving. But it was still there was not much vertical component to, that was discussed there was not anything front side that was discussed it was just let's, let's just see if you can run and we did some things that were self-governing drills i think i mentioned that we put two before us now and some and we're trying to run over those mostly to see if we can increase stride length and we did that as opposed to as an alternative to stick drills because we ran stick drills a lot of people tried to reach out and, and cast the leg to make big contact with the mm-hmm. stick or go past the stick and the, the two before it made you carry the leg over higher over the contact past the stick. So it changed the mechanics, of, particularly stop to top end speed mechanics. Yeah, the two by fours. How did you set them so so how high they were off the ground? Was it just like the the, the flat, or were you standing them up? 
a little bit. Standing them up. There was two inches on the ground, four inches. Oh, got ground. it. Okay, got it. So I, would you originally say that I thought they were just kind of flat on the ground like a paint stick, but a little higher. So, oh, that, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it almost seems like, too, like I think people could almost get carried away with how high the, you know, once the those hurdles are like eight inches, 10 inches, mm-hmm. that's like getting so high where you lift, you have to lift so much, you actually are uh, reducing your horizontal. So it's, uh, it's, I feel Absolutely. like that's like the perfect, that's like the perfect height. <laughs> just get your two by fours. Get two by well, fours out. When I train athletes now, I've actually, I make my own hurdles and I make them out of PVC pipe. You can, you can do a pretty good job of that with, and they cost about $3 a piece, but they're four inches high. And what I, what I'm trying to do is just create a visual barrier that makes the athlete know that they have to, you know, pick up the foot and, you know, tighten, tighten up the angles when they are during swing and not cast and reach as much. And it works pretty well for most. Yeah. I think it's funny too. It's like, you know, the idea that you know, the, the slide, like back in the seventies or eighties, the playgrounds are probably a lot more dangerous, you know, and then there were like the lawsuits cause like the dangerous play like or whatever. And now everything's like super safe. So it's like, everything's, you know, the PVC pipes obviously safer, but I, it's funny to think of like 1980s, seventies style, mm-hmm. like, all right, here's just some two by fours and don't, don't trip over it. <laughs> I like, I like that though. Honestly, it make, makes you want to go get some two by fours just to have that, that edge, <laughs> have a little edge to training. It's an easy tool to use. I can tell you. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so you know, Jeff, you were a you know, track guy you know, yourself, and, and started training track, and then working with with non track athletes, obviously in the context of athletic development and speed. And what's your perspective on uh, like like training? The, what's the same and what's different between I'm teaching running mechanics to an athlete? Let's just even just say linear. I, obviously, a soccer player is not going to run like a hundred meter runner in their upright phase of sprinting when they're running down the field. There's going to be some differences. At least for the vast majority of the time, maybe there are some athletes who are able to do that. But what, like, what, what are you looking? What are your considerations when it's like, okay, I'm, t- I'm, I have a team sport and I'm teaching them speed. What thoughts are going through your head? What, what KPIs are you trying to get them to hit? And then at what end also are you like, all right, well, you're not a track athlete, so maybe we won't do X, Y, Z. Well, most uh, most team sport athletes generally, I would say probably three to five percent of can actually actually run pretty well. And I've had some discussions with some track coaches who have it some experience with with team sports and they they kind of agree in that that probably five percent is generous but there are put it briefly there are not a lot of kids that know how to run even you know, they, they'll go to a speed school and they'll go for two weeks and they think that that's all they need to do <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they don't go back and, and repeat it and do enough work to basically make make the motor motor patterns you know permanent the main thing that i, that I see basically is that they, they contact the ground uh, they're frequency freaks. They they mm-hmm. perceive speed as how often are my feet hitting the ground, how fast am I swinging, as opposed to how is my body moving through space? How how am I, how am I displacing my body forward through space? And so they basically every everything is abbreviated regarding the you know, hip hip articulation and roll turn. Arms are short. When you begin to do drills that open them up. And, and, and then the frequency slows down slightly. They think they're slowing down. And the only thing that convinces them is when you put a stopwatch out there and you, know, you ran this 10-yard this mm-hmm. ten, ten segment one-tenth of a second faster. Well, one-tenth and tenth of a second doesn't mean anything to them. They think it's a real short real short period of time, and it is. I said, at this speed, it's probably one and a half feet to two feet. So, you know, if you're a foot and a half faster to a ball and you get possession of the ball, you made a play that, that you don't, you haven't made before. And part of it is buy-in. I mean, they, they know they know that it's uh, the speed is important, but the coaches, you know, the tactical aspect of what they do basically is, is is predominant. The hard part is to get them. One of the things that we actually do is, is to say, okay, you know, what I want you to do, I want you, I'm going to train you to make one play that you don't normally make. And you go, only one? I said, well, you can make more. That's great. Let's say you make one. You have 11 players on our team. Let's say we we all make a we all make one play that's plus eleven. We have eleven plays that we haven't made. That's eleven plays that the other team did not make. So we're plus twenty two. If we have twenty two more possessions than the other team, we'll probably win the game. But the the main thing is is that they they don't know how to open up. They don't know how to apply force to the ground correctly. And this the breaking phase in in field athletes is is way too long. You know, get, getting the shortened con- contact, understanding how stiff the ankle is to basically modify force application is one of the more difficult things that should happen to do. 
I know when speaking with coaches who prepare NFL athletes for the combine, one thing you'll almost always hear, or at least I'm sure if you ask them, they would say is one of the first things to teach them is patience. Cause yeah, like you said, they're just, they're frequency freaks. Like that's their, that's kind of their language. And it is something that you don't understand until you have a clock on you that it, like you feel like you're going faster, you know, by, by, by putting your feet down as fast as you can or whatnot, or spinning your wheels. And it's funny. It's like, even in working with swimming, I think I understood this a little bit is like the, uh, the idea of uh, where you're slipping, where you're actually trying to move water so fast that your hands actually slip through the water faster than your ability to hold on to it, which I think is an interesting, you know, an interesting thing that I picked up from swimming. So it's, it definitely makes sense with those, those individuals, you know, kind of piggybacking off of that. And maybe this would lend to like the hundred meter thing. You, you said three to 5% of athletes like know how to run well or, or can run well. Like they get up right and they, they, they can run with some patience and good position. They apply force to the ground better. Uh, than their mm-hmm. peers, how much do do you, would you expect? I guess if if I could frame it that way, like how like what would your expectations be for a field sport athlete in terms of improving their running mechanics? I mean, obviously, like I said, like you know, there, there's a spectrum on one end. You know, make you like a, a track athlete ability that level of skill. The on the other end of the pendulum is just frequency based, very like flat running team sport athlete spinning real fast. You know, not able to have any sort of rigidity on that front side coming down i mean what what are you hoping for like in terms of like that pendulum in between like what's a good like objective to say okay we at least got you in this bandwidth i think that's going to help you know serve you for what you're doing in the on the field now in an optimal situation you can make a huge difference there the problem that we have in the team sports is that we don't get them consistently and enough to do a really good job for most of the athletes some of them pick it up fairly quickly but where i where I would want to go with them, basically, and they're never going to be sprinters, but they certainly can improve their speed to a great degree. Mechanically, making sure that uh, they're applying force correctly. Some of them, actually, if I actually get them stronger, in some situations, they actually slow down because they're applying force. They're misapplying force. They're actually, the breaking phase even gets a little bit longer. But a lot depends on that how much does, it, does the coach want them to, to improve athletically, not tactically, but athletically. How long do they allow you to have them? Will they allow you to have them in an optimal situation where you can you know, synchronize the, the strength training with, with the speed work? The main problem that we encounter with them is that it's hit or miss. It's a, one week does not mimic the next, and it's difficult to plan. But succinctly ask the question, answer the question, if you have them optimally, depending on the athlete, you can do a lot. You can make them much, much faster. And a lot, a lot depends on body types, too. You get such a variation in body types. Certain body types tend to tend to gravitate towards certain types of sports. So, uh, like for instance, if I'm re- coaching field hockey, their body type tends to be a little bit different than lacrosse would be, or volleyball would be, or soccer. So you, you have to approach it slightly differently, and maybe your goals change a little bit. You know, from an acceleration standpoint, it's much easier than it is to, from a top end speed standpoint to improve with certain sports, but. If I can get to the ball faster and you can improve the speed to get to the ball faster, you're going to make plays you would not normally make and you can get plus 22 or greater than that. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll jump right into one of these questions here that I would probably have saved, but I, I want to ask it as long as it's fresh in my head. Is You talked about the opportunity to line up the speed and the strength programs. And you talked about how some athletes actually getting stronger in the weight room or applying more force was almost working against them. And so what are some ways to do it wrong in the gym uh, in, in trying to sync up the speed program and the gym program that you see? And then how, how and then ha- progress to how do you optimally see the two working together? There's a lot of information out there now that's better than it used to be. But one of the things that we always talked about was, was the garbage truck. It's really easy to build a garbage truck in the weight room. And by that, I mean that, you know, I'll ask my athletes, you know, everybody knows what a garbage truck is. Give me a characteristic of a garbage truck. And they go, oh, it's big and heavy. You know, it carries lots of trash. And I said, well, it's, it has one of the you know, highest horsepower engines in the automotive industry. I said, but you, have you ever seen a garbage truck race? And then and they'll laugh. And the type of strength you develop, obviously, is, is as important or more important than the absolute value of the strength itself. In the past, we've all been squat oriented. We want to do we want numbers. Coaches want numbers. And if you have a number-oriented coach, it's difficult to overcome that sometimes when you're doing power work. 
and you've been there before, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Coaches are getting a little bit better. If you have, you know, a decent dialogue with them, you can explain some things. But being able to understand the neurological toll of certain types of lifts and certain types of workouts and where you place it in relationship to when you do your acceleration work or when you do your top end speed work or when you do your agility work. If you have team athletes and you're doing a lot of lateral work, the neurological toll on that is, is incredible. So you got you to be very strategic in where you put within the workout, where you put your speed development and within the, the micro cycle, the weekly cycle, or the monthly cycle, how you arrange that is the distance fit from you know, your skill workout. Would you say, I mean, so basically the uh, like an example obviously would be like doing I, I think you probably see this a lot like the athlete goes in the weight room does like uh, almost like more of a hypertrophy type draining leg or lower body workout and then the next day goes into do acceleration or something like that like i think that's pretty common when the when there's not like a lot of communication or or whatnot in terms of the course of the program i mean i'm assuming it's, it's kind of more like that or or even within the course of the day itself well it's it's, it's not quite that bad but um the numbers-driven coaches generally, they, they just care about basically, are my, are my kids getting stronger without any yeah. regard to what yeah. what kind of strength is it? you know, And does it transfer to what I'm doing on the field? College athletics, college strength coaches now are a lot smarter than they used to be in, in that regard and can do a better job of, of communicating with the coaches and telling them what's valuable. Power work, you know, obviously strength work is a basis and foundation for power work. But a lot of power work you know, can be done uh, you know, straight off the bat without without tons and tons of strength development behind it in that you can do some plyometric stuff. You can actually do some, some ballistic type of lifts that transfers more to what you do on the, on the field. You mentioned earlier, we were talking about oscillation type of training. Some of the things that I used to do with my athletes and it's very successful. And a couple of other coaches have adopted it since I've spoken with them. And you actually interviewed one of them a couple of years ago. It's oscillation training in that, you, you'll do something along the lines of a squat. And basically, you'll have short bounces, and short oscillations. It's like static training. It's like uh, isometric type of work, except that you're, you're, it's dynamic time under tension instead of static time under tension. You're bouncing up and down. You're affecting the, the fascia. You're affecting the uh, connective tissue. One of the things that, you know, if you've ever watched a, a, a baseball catcher run, they don't run very well because they're always in an isometric static. Position. They're very, very strong but they're always basically squatting in, their, in an isometric static position. If you take that similar position and begin to do some bounce work with it, and you can do it through different angles, you'd be surprised how fast you'll get strong. And that, that strength actually transfers more to speed development, jumping development, deceleration, and just the plain old squat does. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, simplyfaster.com. SimplyFaster.com is a fantastic coaching resource, not only on the level of their blog and all the information they put out, but also on the level of their online store. With the click of a button, you can see and purchase the technology that is utilized by so many of the world's great coaches. In SimplyFaster.com's online store, you can have access to training technology such as blood flow restriction training, timing systems, including the free lap timing system, bar speed tracking devices, a variety of resistance training machines, such as the K-Box, and also Kaiser training units, which Kaiser training units being strongly recommended by sprint coach Randy Huntington, for example. You'll also get access to motorized sprint training units such as the 1080 sprint, force plates, and much more. You can check that all out by heading to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, it, it's how you go tell the catcher, hey, after every like... Um, you know, a few batters, you have to do a few bounces up and down or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it reminds me a little bit of um, like Jay Schrader had this uh, low squat foot jumps or, or which is basically like little small oscillations in a, like a 90, 100 degree, mm -hmm. 100 degree squat. And where did oscillatory reps start becoming popular? I, I'm just curious because I hadn't heard about it since I think Cal Dietz might have been the first person to kind of bring it into my frame of vision or somewhere around, you know, the, the early 2010s was the first time I had heard of it. I'm curious who, who, you know, where you picked it up from and uh, how that, uh, the history of oscillating reps, just because I, I think it's interesting to see where these things come from. That's a good question. I'm not sure exactly where it originated. Part of it was uh, my thought on it, but part of it was, and Cal Dietz was actually an active part of that. I had a coach that I worked with at Duke named Ryan Feek, who had been in Cal's program and had worked on some stuff, 
some of the triphasic training. Peek was involved in the development of some of that. He was at Wisconsin. He was at Minnesota. He came to Duke. He returned. He had a family issue he needed to take care of, so he actually left Duke. But somewhere in the discussion about time under tension and deceleration work and the eccentric part of it, of lifting, we arrived at oscillatory training. If you've ever seen Javorek or Yavorek, he does waves, and a lot of them are very, very short waves like, like oscillatory training. And he's had some incredibly great success stories that, uh, as a result of how he trains. So this was back in 2006. We went to a Yuri Verkashansky clinic in Lyle, Illinois. And Cal and Jeff Connors from University of North Carolina, Buddy Morris and Thomas Linsky and I were sitting around a table talking. And we we're talking about oscillatory. You know, it, we ended up talking about some oscillatory training. And some of them had done it, some of it hadn't done it, but they both, they all said that when they had done it, they had, they had some success with it. And I think Cal made it part of his program for, for a long time, and he still does it. Uh, he was in one of the, our speakers two years ago at, the, at our winter clinic, and I talked to him a little bit about that. But he still uses it. He just uses it in a, in a different place and point in time within his training. He, uses it, he used to use it as a staple all the way through. Now he basically picks and chooses, and he targets his, his, his time with it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, Sheldon had mentioned he would within like the triphasic framework, if you're going two weeks of an eccentric or a, or a slow uh, tempo down, then Sheldon would go two weeks of the oscillatory reps, like maybe like a three oscillations plus one regular. And then I think finish with two weeks of a reactive or typical reps. And how much of the year typically sees that type of training for you with the athletes um, seeking to get faster? Um, that's always early preseason. And actually, if you a lot depends on the sport. A lot depends on what I mean, what kind of fall season you know, are, are they playing in the fall, or, they, or is, is their their play schedule limited? It is. Uh, it's very fatiguing. Uh, mm-hmm. Neurologically, it burns you up a bunch. You know, the next day is not not terribly good for anything. But you get strong very very quickly. In a perfect world, if you're able to you know be on a professional team and have a lot of uh, you know, had a massage therapist with you and you can see sleep all you want to. You could do it more often, but I basically begin once we learn how to squat. Once we make sure we're safe doing it, because it's not a, it's not a tempo squat. We're not we're not dropping it at, at a designated speed. We're trying to reverse the bar pretty quickly in a knee flex, uh, hip flex position in a squat. Sometimes we squat high, sometimes we squat low, lower, and bounce. But the reversals are very very quick. We will usually do it for. Uh, Three week period, come off of it and do some uh, power work a little bit, probably for two to three weeks, and then go back to it at some point in time. I uh, talked to Boo Schechtsnyder about it a little bit, and um, I don't know if you know what, what Boo's patterns are. He goes power first and strength second. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in our situation, and we're not we're not in a, a track and field setting where I'm trying to peak for uh, May or June. I'm in a team setting where I'm trying to play well from. If, if, if they're doing it in fall, we'll be playing well in, in, in February, March. So we usually do it six months out, six, six to four months out. Um, maybe as close as three, but it's, it's definitely an off-season training mechanism. Yeah, that makes sense. If you think about like filling buckets, I mean, in, I mean, in, in some technicality, all sport movement is an oscillatory component. It's much more like playing a sport is much more like doing oscillatory reps than it is doing like a, you know, a heavy full back squat. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it has much more of those qualities to it. So, but when you're, you know, going out and you're playing your sport and competing and there's that emotional level, like it makes sense to me that that bucket's kind of, it's kind of full on many levels. Yeah. You go more, do more oscillatory stuff. It's like, all right, the body, I just did this kind of thing for, you know, on a level, you know, it, I, granted, I think the putting that on a bar, you can intensify it and really refine it. But mm-hmm. at that point in season, yeah, it just makes sense. Just typical reps are probably a lot more appropriate, whereas that off season is the time. And yeah, it, with Boo too, yeah, I've definitely in the, especially in the context of track or people who are seeking just a pure output. That starting, with, I I like starting with power as well, just because it's like the base. The base is more of what you're going to be doing when you actually compete, and then you're just putting strength on top of it later versus. Mm-hmm. That it's like otherwise you you might be at risk of building the base if you go strength first and size you might be 
risk of building the base like that, you know, dump truck or garbage truck. <laughs> and then you have to like take that garbage truck and you're just like trying to trick it out throughout the year to make it faster. You know, like you're versus let's make the base like the actual car that's going to be competing. And then we'll just build on it. We'll just give it a big, bigger engine right before we compete, you know, with some extra high intensity weightlifting or versus making that the base. So anyway, anyways, I agree with you. I think it's, it's cool that Boo mentioned that as well. I, I would feel like maybe at some point in our podcast that Boo and I have done, I, Maybe he said that, but I can definitely, definitely see that with him. No, uh, Boo, Boo's a uh, Boo's a good friend, and 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 we discuss we discuss things you know, on occasion. I speak to him about you know, personal issues as much as anything. You know, we 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 just talk as friends, and, and, and some and I don't try to steal anything from him. But he is one of the uh, one of the guys that I admire as much as anyone in the profession. Everything he's done is uh, he's had great results with, and uh, I mean, we talked about you know, the coordination disruption, basically of strength of strength training. You know, slow heavy stuff basically disrupts coordination. So he's like he likes to start with the power first and you know get the synchrony there, sync and link, and then add strength to it. Yeah, uh, not for long long periods of time, and then sync and link again. I was doing some drop sets my last year at Duke. We were doing drop set types of training. We were doing four, four, three, three, two, two in, in Olympic lifts. And um, the next to last, the first in four, 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 and then the three, three. We actually uh, we we went ninety five percent on the first set of three, and on the second set of three, we went down to seventy percent. Ninety five percent for three, basically three rep max. Basically, what we did we went four, four, three, three. Two two, uh, on the set of two, the first set of two. After we, we we went like a three rep max, and we dropped way down. On the first set of two, basically, we had athletes who were doing their personal best. First set of two, fourteen lifts into the workout. Wow! One day we had eighteen people PR in a single weightlifting session on cleans doing drop sets during a workout. We weren't we weren't even peeking or trying to trying to test, and they and they just didn't. So I told him about it and he said he tried it on one or two of his athletes he said it seemed to work on them so we're still in discussion about it so i'll, I'll if you speak with him you can yeah. ask him about it at well, point in time. yeah may i get him on the podcast here in the in the near future we can talk about that that the the sync and link thing i, I love just like phrases that that encapsulate it so well I think that it's so easy to look at when we look at just raw qualities in our periodization, it's like, Oh, base of strength. Well, what does that mean? You know, (laughs) like how about a base of what makes the human body operate at a really high level and then link it to some more strength, you know, I just think, but that requires nuance, you know, that requires, and and nuance is a very, I don't know, it's a word that's easy to throw out there to sound smart or whatever. Like it requires just looking into the system on a deeper level that really to really look at what, how the human body operates and how to, how to like, yeah, how to just, and I I find too, it's almost like the body is more ready for strength when it's operating at a really high level. You know, everything is linked up. The body's in alignment. It's in balance. It's doing really fast things that is feeding dopamine and like, and it excites the nervous system. And then it's like, yeah, pile some weight on the bar. We're good for this now versus the other way around. It's just like straining the lift of the weight in a bilateral setup, you know, for the base or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not against, I like bilateral heavy lifts, but it, it's like I said, as an appropriate, at the appropriate place and in the appropriate context when the body's ready, ready to be linked up to that stuff. No, absolutely. Neurologically, I feel like it's an advantage, like you said. When I'm linked, you know, everything is working in synchrony and it's much, much easier to particularly overcome inertia when that, when it is linked up like that. So I used to be the old school guy. You know, I go strength first and then go to power. And, you know, it's worked much better when we started with power, then go to strength and come back to power. Yeah. 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 That, that waving back and forth too. I, I like that. Okay. So talking about, uh, I do want to get into, yeah, some of these, these um, basic human components, the ability to oscillate, turn on and off within the scope of speed training as well. We were talking about a little bit before so the seventies used to be the world of backside push, which I. I just, I, again, I just find that funny to think of people actually running like that. But then again, now we're in the world of like, oh, show me these like canned, like neat little drills that, that are based off a of position that I think are easy to understand and, and do, you know, like, like dribbles or a skips or whatever, you know, very popular. 
But you, tell me about your thoughts on those, because I don't think those are around in the 70s, really. You know, your thoughts on those, the, the good side of them, and then the potential drawbacks, and then how you treat those in context of sprint training and sprint performance. Now, are you speaking uh, like A skips B skips, or mock drills, or are you speaking about dribbles and bleeds and things like that? What, what were you referring to? Uh, all of it, yeah. <laughs> all, all of it, yeah. You could, you could, we could go with it, mock drills first and then dribble drills and bleeds, or... You know, uh, whatever ones you want to talk about or approach. Well, when mock drills became, let this, I won't say a fad, but it, it became the thing. Everybody thought you could skip your way to speed. I've, I've never seen anyone skip their way to speed. They're proprioceptive drills. They're, they're, they're postural drills. They're basically, they're you know, designed to put your body in a position through a, through a submaximal range of motion. I mean, a submaximal speed. The proprioceptive value is, 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 is the greatest thing that I see. I don't see many coaches doing B skips. I don't see them doing a lot of kickouts. You know, the theory was behind you. I mean, you, you pick it up and kick, kick, kick the shin out. You're, you're activating the hamstring. I have found that when I do that, I actually encourage my athletes, the non-track athletes, to cast when they when they run. They they think they're supposed to kick their legs yeah. out. So we don't do anything like that. We'll do some we'll do some Bs. I personally have never used a wall drill, and the reason I don't is because I don't like locking the shoulders down. So what I do, I've, I've used belts or I have used inner tubes when we get inside them. And we basically will run and, I will, and, and it allows them to use their arms as they do something like a wall drill. It'll hold you in an inclined position. And it requires a lot more, a lot more balance, a lot more strength to basically be able to hold that position. So it is like a wall drill, but it is it's being held at the waist. And it's not, and I'm not bracing my arms up here and limiting my ability to synchronize my arms with, with my legs as I'm trying to move through those ranges of motion. From a dribble standpoint, things around contact, I've used it a little bit, not a ton. And the reason is because it's, it's, a, it's a longer learning curve for my athletes. So I try to put them in, I put self-governing drills. And in order for them to accomplish the drill and to get through it, they have to do things well. And uh, one of the videos that you saw is when we run down a line and go over cones. In effect, that's almost a drill. We do that flat-footed sometimes. I was reading something from Kente Bell a couple of years ago about how he, he did a flat-footed running. And it's very much like a dribble. It's, it's like a dribble bleed. where you, you, you start out and you, you run into, you take about a 10-meter 10, 10 acceleration into the cones. You're not coming full speed. And sometimes the cones are all a consistent distance apart. Sometimes they actually extend as you lengthen them out slightly as you pick up speed. But basically... I, I do that for ground contact purposes. I do it basically to make the hips rotate farther forward. I find that most athletes, non-track athletes, don't know how to, to use their hips very well. They they basically, the hips and shoulders rotate in opposition, and when the hips don't don't go, don't extend and, and articulate like they they normally would in a sprinter, go, go farther to the front. The knee lift in front is is restricted. The swing leg knee blocks. The apex is lower, and when it blocks early, the, the tendency is the momentum carries the shin out. You begin to cast. So I do down-the-line runs a lot just to get the, the, the athletes to be able to feel what happens in the spine, what happens in the hips, and how the shoulders and the arms link with the hips as they begin to move to try to you know, work, work on stride length development. Just That's really the, quickly, the, the, could I, you describe the down-the-line run? Sorry, I don't want to cut you off at all, but I know I saw I saw the video. So I, but mm -hmm. could you describe that? Because and just for a, maybe comparison's sake, I know Chris Corfus has done mini hurdles with the line where he's actually having the athletes like split the line on each step. I think you're actually mm -hmm. having them step on like on the line. Or could you just uh, tell me how that works a little bit more before you go? I, I try to target the line, and, and basically I'm working on basically the hips. What, what happens is they come down a line. You can on any football field, you can use that line. We we, we use four inch cones. They use the little cones, and I'll I'll begin with with the females. We'll start at four to four and a half, usually four feet, starting out just to get them used to it. The men run four and a half to five feet, and basically we'll just run over the cones, uh, run over the cones, and try to make ground contact on the line itself. Most athletes can't get to the line. But what I'm trying to do is, is bring the knee further toward the center line. Most of them, if you watch field athletes run, there's a great separation from the front between the knee. One of the things that uh, you read much research on sprinters, 
stride width is one of the things that basically uh, affects top end speed. They've done a couple of research papers on uh, sprinters in uh, some of the world world championships and uh, more elite meets, and they found that the people who run the fastest also have you know, the least amount of distance laterally. Hmm. Stride width is narrower in acceleration, in particular. When you come out, if you can drive the knee more toward the center line, you you, you put the force vectors in place where they need to be, basically, so you can optimally apply force. I watched a uh, video one time of uh, Tyson Gay and Asafa Powell in Gateshead, England. They left the blocks at the very same time, same same start foot forward, and it looked like synchronized swimming as they came down. The synchronized running ground contacts were identical as they came towards you. Uh, as he got to the finish line, a softer power hit the line, and Tyson Gay took another stride and a half. In watching him run, Tyson Gay's his, his knees, he did a lot of squatting, so he was slightly externally rotated as his knee came to apex in front. Powell ran a right smack on the line. As one, except for Shelly Ann Frazier, Price, most of the Jamaican runners run pretty close to center line, particularly the men, hmm. if you watch them from the front. And there was a guy named Eric Corum at the time. I don't know if you know who Eric is. Yeah, he's been on the podcast once or twice. At least least once. He he had worked with Tyson at uh, at Arkansas uh, when he was uh, an intern there. And I was working with with Tyson and Veronica Campbell-Brown. And uh, I just told him what I noticed. And in his strength training, he decided to do box step-ups with the heel off the box, basically, to kind of activate the adductor a little bit more. And he told me Tyson uh, you know, improved to a great degree. Yeah, and I think not long after that, uh, that's when he ran his American record, uh, like you know, eight, nine months after that. So that's one of the theory behind basically coming down the line. I got, I got off on a tangent. That's no, okay. Uh, that's a good behind, tangent. That's a good tangent. The theory behind coming down the line basically is allow the hips to, to go through their full range of motion. When you abbreviate hip, the hip range of motion, you also abbreviate the shoulder range of motion. Yeah. Then you become you become a frequency freak. You know, let them go through full range of motion. Let let the spine torque, let it store energy and release it. And if you abbreviate the range of motion of the hips, the arms follow suit for balance and rhythm. Uh, when that happens, everything shortens up and you and you stay in your frequency freak mode and your stride length. It's, it's very difficult to increase stride length. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. It, it makes me think too about the like the Jamaican sprinters. Uh, from my understanding, they don't like to squat too much, like Usain Bolt, like didn't like to squat. It makes you think about like maybe there's some subconscious like preservation of that quality. I mean, I've never actually considered the effect of just because. I mean, in most of my programmings, I mean, I have squatting, but it's it's not like a lot, and it's usually set up with the heels <clears throat> elevated, and I there's not some of the same compensations people might get who are like doing a real like low bar back squat with feet flat on the ground. But it would be interesting to see some of the stride width, the changes in stride width and upright full on sprinting that happen. If you do a lot of like feet flat back squatting or something like that, I'd be curious. Mm -hmm. I've had some really good results from my athletes by doing box step ups with the heel off the box. Years ago, there was a guy named Henry Messam from Jamaica and uh, he was Don Quarry's coach. He was Lennox Miller's coach. And there's a lineage of coaches. I think that uh, Glenn Mills and Steve Francis have come through people in his program uh, and have, have picked up on some of that. The advantage of off the off the box heel off the box step ups is that it engages, it activates the adductor slightly more, and for ankle stiffness purposes, and you know just basically foot tendon strength, it makes a huge huge difference. It's difficult to do to begin with, and you don't have to. You don't want to go too high. But from a linkage and sink, sink and link standpoint, it pays big dividends. Yeah, I like, um, you know, what you were, when you were talking about the running on the line, I think a lot of people would think about, I mean, at least this did cross my mind, at, but the idea of, well, what if you're a crossover runner? You know, like, what if you're, like, what if you're crossing over the line, like, over the midline, right, when you run, like, people who do do that and whatnot. I mean, but then again, I mean you know part of it's like well why are you doing that are you a little bit bow-legged you know or like like allison felix doesn't she's like one of the best sprinters of all time right like what point is this <laughs> detrimental they what 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 it, when is it a detrimental strategy i mean i, I i'm curious though hearing your thoughts on that i believe because i i believe chris corfus does have an anecdote i need to ask him or or find it where like an athlete was like a legit crossover runner he did like the drill to get them a little more stacked and 
and then they improve their time. But I also, I will say this too, I, I see something I'm getting really into lately is the idea of doing like cross connects where like, let's just say you're standing on your left leg, you lift your right knee up in front of you, and then you connect your left arm to that right knee, like diagonally in front of the body in the center line. So like you said, the shoulders have to rotate, the hips have to rotate. It's good for hip extension. And, and, I, and I absolutely see, it's almost like the run on the line is like the natural sprint extension of that cross connect. I, I see it from a rotational perspective. In fact, I'm probably going to go out and try it later today. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm just curious what your thought is on the, with the, in context of crossover running or athletes who might cross over too much or things like that. I don't. I've only seen one or two athletes in, in, in my life that actually do that, and I don't know exactly why they do that. Yeah, it is detrimental. You don't. You don't really want to cross over the line, and you, and the, the good sprinters don't actually get on a line. They don't run on a the line. They run very close to the line. Yeah, we yeah. Like usually, you, we use the line as a target. It's uh, usually unachievable, but I want them to make the effort to get there because then they have to concentrate to to attempt to get there. Yeah. It's like it, when we do flat-footed running, and that sounds like it's uh, in totally in juxtaposition, or, or, or totally juxtaposed to what we, we we're taught to do. What's worked for me there is when, when, you, when you try to do flat-footed running, most people can't run flat-footed. But what it does, it just when they when they swing the leg through to to this highest point to apex, they attempt to accelerate it faster to get to the ground and to be in a position to be to be flat-footed. Occasionally, you'll you'll see them hit flat, but they're trying to get back down. And here again, they'll squat slightly to make that happen. But when the knee gets up, they don't get lazy with it. They have to come back down and actually try to hit as quickly as they possibly can. When they do that, if they can get to something close to flat, you're taking the ankle out of the equation. You have almost the same vertical vertical forces at work, same verticality, but now you're distributing all that force over, over two joints, the hip and the knee instead of the ankle. It's amazing that once you do that, the athletes will tend to bounce. They, 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 they feel real poppy. Mm-hmm. And when you bring them back to normal run, they go, wow, I feel so much faster. If you take the ankle out of the equation and just, and just overload the other two joints with flat footed run, they actually see, they look like they're getting off the ground. Ground contact times look, look reduced to a great degree. Yeah, I look at I look at the spectrum of things, and um, I, I want to get into this before our time's up today. But uh, you know, all, all things being a, a, this like spectrum and finding balance points is squatted running. You know, Darian Barr introduced me to squatted running. I know you've um, you've done Groucho runs, which I, I was actually going to ask you about the history of when those started. But to me, it look it, I feel like, it, and even in in teaching squatted running, a, a Darian would have me do it flat footed, and I never understood why. He's just let's do it flat footed, and I guess, I guess over time I was like, well, maybe this just really fits with mid stance or pronating or something. But I know that after practicing squatted running, and I remember he had me run a squatted four hundred, which was one of the more difficult things I've done <laughs> in my life. I don't know why. I think Pain, he, painful for his own entertainment, or I don't know what. But <laughs> I tell you what, it was like it was like four days after that that I ran the fastest. 10, 10 meter fly that would like i had run since i was i was, I ran faster at 34 than i had when i had tried it at like 23 and you know doing all like the tall step over the knee type running t- technique and but of course i didn't run that when i actually ran the fly i didn't run it flat footed but like you said it was something about training like that that it, it's like a constraint where it's like okay i'm just taking your foot kind of out on a level and i'm just putting it all on the, the hip and the knee and the rotation up top and then when you go back to being able to use the forefoot, it's like, bam. I mean, it's just like, you know, this. Uh, and so I, I'm almost looking at it. Well, an athlete who struggled if, in teaching squatted running or, you know, how to you know get that constraint, maybe just say that maybe the starting point is to say, hey, just do flat footed running, you know, like that. That's mm-hmm. going to bring your hips down a little bit. It's going to make you more squatted. So I'm, I think that's a really interesting concept. That's something I'm going to be playing around with as well, for sure. It's almost like the, the entry point to, to starting to be a little more squatted as a constraint to eventually run normally and run faster we do the flat footed running over the cones so they, they can't cheat as far as is range of motion and leg swing is concerned from a, a squatty run standpoint or, or a groucho standpoint i i basically was watching rehabilitation i was in a rehabilitation clinic one day and they were re-educating this lady she had a stroke and they're trying to do, teach her how to, how to walk again and when the legs are constantly under tension, it was easier for her to keep to keep her balance. And basically, she could transfer weight better when her legs were constantly under tension as opposed to being relaxed and, and, and loading. And I was watching how she was, she was actually, she was moving. And 
you can't go backside if you do squatting right. It's a great front side mechanics teacher. If you if you try to if you try to go backside when you're squatting running, you're going to face plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here again, it's another self governing drill. You don't want to drop down too far, but what you're doing is, is basically is taking away space from the athlete. You're making them be more efficient if they complete one one gait cycle. They're doing it in in, in less space. So the knee, the angles of the knee changes. The the, the levers swing differently. It speeds up, and uh, you, you get higher knee lift in front from the release point in the back and take off. It has to swing through quicker. It has to swing through more efficiently, do greater ranges of motion. And um, something you you will hit flat footed sometime depending on how far how far you displace your center of gravity vertically. But I have found that the athletes that I've trained that we we do grouchos with or squatty runs with immediately come back behind that and have a, have, have a complete mechanical change in their regular running. The backside is reduced. The front side is much, much better. And they're more upright. They don't try to push the ground as long as they can, as hard as they can. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's really the flat foot part that's kind of the magic of that. Because with the squatty run, if you somehow could <laughs> do it on the balls of your feet, like kind of a really late stance dominated you might like over push, you know, it's almost like by doing the flat foot thing, it almost sets you up to be balanced. And then once you're balanced, the only place to go is to use that rotational force of the leg to get a little bit more front side, but it's a way that's natural. It's not like, like if you just tell athletes to go run with high knees, it almost never goes well. <laughs> like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't go well at all. You have, you have to, you have to put them in a self governing situation almost. Yeah, exactly. A hundred. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so it's, that's where it's like all these, all this stuff, like it's like the mock drills or the uh, mock drills, a skips for you know, people who aren't familiar with that terminology. It's like so much of that is I think people just want to see positions and they want ideals, but it's like what you really just need to do is put the athlete in a constraint where they can control it and feel it and time it out on their own. And then they go to normal running and they're going to carry it with them. You know, it, it's just, I think we, I think we like these clean, neat little drills so much that it takes us away from from timing and, and putting athletes where they can sort these things out and figure out the, the timing on their own. There's, there's no force being applied in, in an A-skip or anything. I don't know yeah. if you've ever seen them. The research paper is 200 pages long. I'll be glad to send it to you. Yeah, I'd be happy to it, check it out. Where it basically says that A-skips and B-skips don't transfer to speed. And it, it's, it's, it's got a ton of research in it. I read through about a hundred pages of it. And actually, I couldn't make it any farther, to be honest with you. But, um, That's a long paper to just to say it doesn't. I mean, I, I feel like you could say it about you know five or ten pages. But it's a, it's two hundred it pages long. So far. And going, wow! One of the things about squatty running too, at the point of takeoff, there is more knee flexion. The, the knee can't can't extend. We do know that fast people don't totally triple extend. Momentum carries that knee into some extension, but as far as force application is concerned. They're not trying to apply force through full triple extension. I don't know if you've ever seen Jan Mellon's study. You have uh, uh, strength speed. He has a he has a paper or, or a book called Speed Strength, and it is uh, it's it's a wire bound book and it's got some translation issues with it. But he's collected data. Uh, it's very very interesting to look at the knee angles and things on elite sprinters versus collegiate sprinters versus the average kid coming out of high school. Got a lot of comparisons, but the force application aspect of during stance basically it, the whole premise of front side mechanics is don't let the thigh pass too far past vertical it's hard to get it back so the, the more elite sprinters tend to run with more knee flexion at takeoff than the slower ones do they don't they don't try to triple extend to, to take off you're saying the sorry i'll have to so at the the leg that's on the ground at the moment the foot leaves the ground, they have more knee flexion. The elite ones have mm -hmm. a little bit more flexion than the non-elite at that point. Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. I just I was just make sure it's the yeah. stance leg and not the swing leg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes total sense to me. I mean, I I couldn't agree more. And yeah, squatty runs, they put you, they put you, they make you do that more than just about anything. You can't. Mm -hmm. You. It would be almost impossible to. To extend in a squatty run the leg that's on the ground, you would have to so forcefully push with your quads. It would just be the most artificial and weird thing in the world. So um, you'll face plant, you, you, you'll hit the ground. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. One of the things I was thinking too, is that uh, on the line runs, I almost wonder if that would be an interesting precursor to bounding for some people, because it's like so rotational, you know, to, 
or, or looking at where the feet come down in a bound, you know, versus a sprint or something like that. I mean, just, I'm always thinking about ways to teach bounding, you know, for people who need to bound or where it's helpful mm-hmm. for you. And so that could be another, that might be something I have to play around with as well, because your road bounding is just about, you know, taking that running stride out and extrapolating it into more rotation and more range. So it yep. seems like the online on the line ringer, if you almost exaggerated the stride, like on of the online to something beyond sprinting, you know, where it's no longer useful. I mean, you probably cast and stuff, but I don't know if you're a triple jumper. I was trying to think of, I was trying to think of how do you teach bounding? Why can't some people learn it? You know, I mean, there's there's other structural elements at play as well, but you know, I'm always just thinking about how to how to other self self constraining drills that aren't overly complicated that get people in touch with what it means to rotate and link shoulders and glutes. So one last uh, thing to kind of tie it all together a little bit is I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you have a good um, anecdote or case study about uh, your work with Torrance Hunt uh, in the forty yard dash. You know, time time you chopped off I think it was like you know four four to four two. I'd be curious for you to go specifically into that to, to kind of to see where some of this stuff goes. And I know we didn't get into a lot of like the plyometrics. I would love to. Maybe we can have another conversation about that. But just to talk a little bit about how some of this stuff comes together in, uh, I guess, Torrance or, or any other athletes you want to mention who really have, you know, how you see that these drills really improve their <clears throat> mechanics and speed and abilities. I had a, a young man who used to come down and watch my pro track group run. He and his dad would come down and watch. And, um, he was an athlete at one of the local high schools, and he came down for a couple of years to watch. He wanted to play football, and he ran track. And he was, he was, he was pretty good. He was, he was quick. The one thing he was, he was incredibly wired. His nervous system was, was something that you, that you don't see very often. He was incredibly reactive. He was very elastic, but he was a lot like some basketball players. He was elastic through a limited range of motion. And he was uh, doing some of the – he was running track, but he was also doing some of the football – the combine type things uh, like the Nike combines and things that, uh, cause he wasn't getting a lot of attention from, from the, the recruiters or the colleges. He was, he was getting some, some feelers, but he wasn't getting any, any real in-depth work. So he asked me if I would help him out. He wanted to, he ran a four, four, five hand time 40, which is certainly not chopped liver. That's pretty good. Yeah. But for his size and for, and it was not something that was, you know, just incredibly earth shaking. And was wasn't fast enough that people thought he, he could carry it to the football field and do a good job. So I said, well, we'll do this. But what's going to happen is it's going to affect your track running a little bit. There's things that we would not normally do in season like this. We would normally do these things in the off season. They have a high neurological toll. You're going to feel flat. Some of your performances in track won't be as good. But you have a limited you know length of time to make this happen. So we'll do it. Uh, he was doing all the conventional stuff that, that you see in, in most programs. So I said, we're going to do some things probably that you haven't seen, but if you want to try it, we will. So he was willing to do it. He was a frequency freak. He had a very short stride. His, he had a not an incredible, incredible amount of force at ground contact. So I had to make him big. I had to lengthen him out. I had to make him actually, I had to make him hit the ground harder. And so we did some things that, most people haven't seen before. You know, split lunges on boxes uh, to, to basically get him to apply force to greater ranges of motion. I had to make him understand what fe- what feeling big was, and then I had to push him too big. I had to really in- in- increase everything. I said, you're going to feel slower because you're not going to be contacting the ground as, as often. But in flight, your stride length is going to increase. And I want you to begin to perceive speed as how fast you're moving through space as opposed to how fast your limbs are hitting, feet are hitting the ground. So we used, we were lucky, we went to football fields, and he began to uh, begin to think of speed as how fast are the lines passing by me. It's like riding down the road in the middle of the night, and you got street lights. So how fast are the street lights passing? The hurdler, how fast are the hurdle bars coming at me? Um, when he changed his thought process, and he, he, began, to, he began to understand that, uh, Activity was not productivity. He was very, he was very active, but it wasn't very productive. Um, and bought into it, he started getting a lot faster. We did, we did a lot of things where he had to push through extreme ranges of motion because I knew that when he came back to full speed, that he would, he would go back to old motor habits. Uh, but eventually, they got bigger. I didn't have him long enough to make him really, really good. But he got a four, four, five hand time to a four, two, five electronic time. 
uh, the, the, the combine electronic time when, when FAT, but the method they use, um, which is the fastest high school time ever run. It's the third fastest ever run by anybody at a combine. He did it at the Baltimore combine. He ran 429 and 428. Uh, and the People, the coaches who were there who were running the clinic said, would you mind running again? We <laughs> think that the, that the, uh, the equipment's malfunctioned. And the third time he ran 425, it's on YouTube. If you look at it, it doesn't look like it's anything special. And he certainly is not where I wanted him to be, but he's certainly better than where he was. Uh, 425 is not chopped liver. It's pretty good. And uh, he started getting some, you know, a lot of people paid attention because he, he was the fastest guy that ever did it. And basically, all we worked on was was what we call the exchange, and I call it the exchange with him. So that's what he understood: exchanging positions of legs. I got one leg back, one leg forward, one leg is leaving the ground, one leg is in the air, coming to the ground. I want to exchange those positions. So we talked about the exchange. I want to work your hips so that you can speed up and increase the range of motion of the exchange. And it was a language that he understood, and uh, it worked really well. Um, Oddly enough, his, his track time didn't, didn't, weren't too affected by it. He actually got better after he got used to the workload. He actually got better after about a month. He started running faster in track. Um, but we did nothing. We didn't do any, anything like you see in, in a conventional track, track workout. We did pro- concentrate on probably, I mean, we, did, we, we ran fast. We did a lot of running. We did a whole lot of work, work over many hurdles. Acceleration-wise, Putting him, make, making him run three to six inches longer per stride, learning how to, you know, the rate of force development work with him as much as anything. But in, in some of the videos that I showed you, like on, on the split lunges, on the boxes, on the split drop to, to knee drive, uh, he began to learn how to apply force and make his hips rotate to a greater degree, slow his arm swing down to match it, synchronize it. And it, it, uh, I was lucky. I mean, it worked. Yeah. So it it sounds like, and maybe I'll just kind of leave a touching on this is you talk about like the split lunges to a box. So I, I think about to, um, like, like switching drills, like, you know, like a skips and B skips. And there's like iterations where you're, um, like, like actually doing a full switch in the air. And like you said, like the, you need to like learn how to switch to create a little bit bigger stride length there. But it seems like the, the lunge based variations are gonna, where you will get the biggest range switch. And versus maybe some of the like more sprint drill <laughs> skip drill types well the way we did it he had an elevated foot in the front and the, one of the cues was you must make vertical contact with the box you can't kick out to it and yet the knee uh-huh. has to come up and immediately reverse and come down and hit it and by putting him in a lunge position we, we put him in a compromise a mechanically disadvantaged position basically we took space away from him if you've noticed there's some starts that we did off of the box we're actually from a knee position, they'll come. He can, will come off of a box, and and go over a, a mini hurdle. His initial steps of acceleration were way too short, and he couldn't initiate it very well. He wouldn't. He wouldn't come out of a block very well. So, from a lunge position, we basically took him off of a, of a eight inch box, and uh, made him accelerate. Use the front edge of the box as, as like the front, like the the front block in a in a start. And give him targets. You must step over this hurdle. You got to step over this hurdle. Two things happen. He increased his stride length. He slowed down his frequency. The the initial first steps would have set up everything he did. If his first two or three steps were really quick, everything subsequent to that would be quick. If I slowed his first couple steps down, everything else behind it would slow down too and allow him to apply force more effectively. But because he was coming from a from an eight inch elevated position. The ground force on, on his first ground contact was much greater than it normally would be. He became incredibly more reactive off that first step. So it wasn't like he was sitting and trying to push it. He got more elastic and his ground contact time was reduced on his first on, on step one. Got it. So for that box drop drill, so he was in like a lunge position on an eight inch platform and then mm-hmm. would go into his first step, like pushing, like front foot on the edge of the box, kind of like let the shin drop off the box into the first step, like that kind of thing. And then, and then you hit the ground at a decrement and you have like, is that, is that, I mean, maybe I can get videos for the stuff in the show notes too. I think that'd be helpful as well. So uh, there's, there's, there's a video in there of that. <clears throat> so you're, I mean, the boxes are two, two feet by four feet, basically half the plywood board cut them there. And you would get in a lunch position on top and his front foot 
would be partially off the front, basically from uh, from the ball of his foot uh, to his toes were extending past the edge of the box. So that when he rotated to push out, that would effectively be like a starting block. He would, he would rotate over that and push, push back off that edge of the block. We give him target areas, uh, many hurdles he had to step over, depending on what kind of stride length I was trying to create. So he had to split really big off the start in order to make that happen. And he was dropping from, from a greater height so that when he made contact on his first step, it was the, the reactive, uh, it, it increased his reactive ability. The, the vertical force was much greater than it normally would have been. It allowed him, some athletes can't, can't lengthen out and open up because they, they don't have time to do it. If you, the concept of taking time away or reducing time. Reducing time would be something like a groucho, or re re reducing time in space would be a groucho run. I'm reducing space in which you have to move. You must move efficiently within that limited space. If I want you to achieve a greater length off the start, I can give you more time to get there. I can make you extend farther. I, you don't have the ground is not coming to you as early, so I will be able to extend to a greater degree before I hit the ground. So I'll move through maybe ten more degrees hip rotation before I actually make contact with the ground. Yeah, I got it. So just, yeah, setting up using mini hurdles to create those kind of like a stride ladder type thing, but with different, like a different starting position as well to reinforce yeah, some qualities is. on top of the stride ladder. Sometimes he came from, from a full lunge where he actually had to leave his knee on the ground and accelerate. Sometimes we, 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 we came up a little bit and let his back, back knee get off the ground four or five inches. Um, as we got, Initially, we started with his knee on the ground. Then we actually let him come up and set up a little bit more like he was he was doing a 40-yard start without putting, not, not a three-point stance, but a two-point stance would be. Yeah, I I think I might have come up with this myself or seen it. I think I came up with, I mean, it probably like sounds like you were doing something like this a long time ago, and I'm sure other people have done this, but the idea of like a shin drag lunge where you're just doing lunges, but as the other leg comes through the foot, instead of coming up high, it just drags along the ground and you can make those steps longer. And if you do that and you take it into a sprint, you usually feel it carry mm -hmm. with you for the yeah. first step or two and can and make bleed it out into a sprint. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, yeah, good deal. It's, it's interesting. I know it's just one anecdote of many, you know, there's with, um, but it sounds like it's, these are really good general principles for those people who are just frequency athletes who really need to learn to be more patient and uh, just setting up constraints that allow them to do that. So I, I think it's it, it helps tie a lot of these things together, even though I, I do think we did talk a lot about top end speed, but it's still um, just thinking outside the box and just um, like you said, he had been doing like all the traditional stuff before he like I'm sure all the all the typical skips and marches and I get that stuff is almost all like frequency too in a way, you know, it's not it doesn't teach you that like lag, you know, where it's like the, you kind of have to get in a lunge to feel that lag, that lag time mm -hmm. a little bit. Well, I had to change his rhythm. His rhythm was, 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 was way too fast. Uh, it was not allowing him to optimally plow force. He was, he, he, he couldn't get a, get a maximum or optimum force application out of any, of any of his stride because he was trying to, he was trying to hit the ground too often. But he ended up dropping four two five hand four four I mean four four five hand to four two five electric was a big 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 drop. Yeah. At that particularly at that speed. You know, you can see that when you're running, you know, fives and high fours, but when you get down into the really fast guys, you don't see that kind of, you know, I mean, as you well know, you know, those improvements don't occur like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, Hey, it's, it's good to tie that all together. And man, Jeff, you, you gave me, I feel like after this show, I'm going to have to have like this massive show notes with like all this research and then some of the drills and things like that. Um, but you know, anything would be appreciated there, but I, I thank you so much for your time today. I, I really enjoy this chat. I really enjoyed the history, the creativity, and just the integration of all these things. It, it's given me a ton of ideas to play around with and, and I'm excited to check out some of the research and, and hopefully chat again. You know, there's a lot we didn't cover today, like plyometrics and whatnot. So, but thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it today. I really have enjoyed it. And I'm very, very, very flattered that you asked me to, to be on your podcast. I know there've been a lot of very well-known, excellent coaches on here. So I, I appreciate the fact that, that you invited me. That wraps up another episode. Thank you so much for being here. This is an awesome journey um, that I get to go on every week, learning more about the human body, speed, performance, uh, and what drives us to level up in our, our training and coaching. I really appreciate you being a part of it. 
If you want to help me out, you can leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Spotify, whatever platform you're listening to the podcast on. I would totally appreciate that. We'll see you all next week.